So our second presenters this morning, you met last night also at Interfaith Worship. They are from the Baha'i Faith, so let me do a little introduction for them. Dr. James P. West is a professor and former longtime chair of the Department of Economics and Business at Moravian University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. He holds a Bachelor in Science degree from Marquette University in Wisconsin, a Master of Commerce from the University of Pune, India, and an MBA and PhD from Lehigh University. Dr. West teaches courses in economics and management, and his research and writing focuses on international development, globalization, and the evolution of economic thought. We are not, however, going to have an economics lecture today. <laughs> <laughs> Professor West spent three years working in rural economic development in India and has been a Fulbright professor at Kamensky University in Slovakia. Dr. West has traveled to India many times and to more than 30 countries throughout the world. Dr. West became a Baha'i shortly after graduating from college and has been an active member of the worldwide Baha'i community for over four decades. He's also a poet. Dr. West is married and has three children. Laura Lawrence. Oops. Okay, so Jim's presenting, but you can read about Laura, who is my colleague on the Interfaith Action Committee of the Lehigh Conference of Churches. So here's what I want you to think about as you welcome our guests. Think about what you learn, what is similar and different from what you heard from Rabbi Seth and what you experienced as a Christian member of the United Church of Christ. Dr. West. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. So I had the opportunity to talk with many of you during the dinner last night and the breakfast this morning and had so many really lovely conversations. Uh, the first thing, as you probably noticed, is uh, I'm not a, a member of the clergy. And we, and in fact, in the Baha'i community, we don't have a clergy at all. So you're going to have to hear from an economist today. <laughs> but you, you might be surprised to know that economists, uh, like accountants, both work, work with numbers and graphs, but accountants have senses of humor. So, so get ready. This is going to be, and, uh, and actually, uh, I was thinking uh, Rabbi Seth is a hard act to follow. Very interesting person. I got a lot from his, uh, uh, from his presentation, but I really like his uh, one acronym. And I think that's his experience in the Navy. I spent a, a, a relatively short time in the Navy compared to his long 20 years, but the, I like the uh, NBD, no big deal. I think I'm going to use that in my, my classroom a lot more often. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the Baha'i faith today. And in speaking with some people in the audience, some people have had some opportunities to encounter Baha'is in their community or to visit some of the Baha'i houses of worship, or some people have been to Israel. Actually, Israel is also the, 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 uh, the holy land for the Baha'i faith. And on Mount Carmel, the shrines of, of the Baha'i faith are there. And uh, so, so people have encountered the Baha'i faith, but a lot of times we don't get into great detail about it. So what I'm going to do today is just kind of offer some thoughts about it and, you know, open up the opportunity that if you ever want to talk more about the faith and why we you know uh, the Baha'i faith, I'd be happy to do that. As was mentioned, I, I was raised, uh, I became a Baha'i right after college and I was raised in a Catholic uh, faith and very, uh, very good Catholic family that we did, you know, we would church every Sunday and we did all the sacraments. And uh, so I was very, uh, very much a, uh, a Catholic. And I went to a Catholic university. And then my senior year in college, I took a course taught by a priest on comparative religions. And the, uh, he talked a lot about Hinduism, a lot about Buddhism, a lot about Judaism, not much about Islam. But, uh, you know, he talked about these religions. And I, I remember reading some of their writings and say, saying to myself, I can understand why people get something out of these writings, you know, that I really got an appreciation of what these religions were about. And then one day I was driving down Lakeshore Drive in Chicago, and a couple of people know this, the, this, the structure there, the Baha'i House of Worship. There's just one in the North America, okay, and that's in, uh, 
in, uh, in Wilmette, Illinois, and um, that uh, I just saw this beautiful building and I thought, I'll have to go in here and see what this is all about. And I read some of the inscriptions over the doors on the, on the building and I said, I'm going to learn more about this. And so I, I, I did become a Baha'i shortly thereafter. And the thing that really attracted me were two things. One, the reminder that life is a spiritual process. Uh, we don't get out of this alive, right? This, there's a purpose to this life. And it's really uh, one analogy that's sometimes given. It's kind of an embryonic life that we live in, that we're here to develop spiritual values and qualities. And we know we're going to leave this world. And the Baha'i teachings and some of the writings that I read really reinforce that idea that we are moral, spiritual beings and we are approaching. Uh, and these are our arms and our legs of our next existence, if you will. And uh, so that this is our this is our purpose here on life is to, to be virtuous. Uh, but secondly, to recognize the greatest need of humanity at this day and age. And I think Valerie Cower did a good job of uh, talking about that last night is the idea that we're all human beings on the same planet, uh, that we're, you know, the, the, the oneness of the, the central theme of the founders of the Baha'i faith through the Baha'i community today is the oneness of the human race that the we're, we're all as a uh, video that actually Laura put that together. Uh, the, the we're all flowers of one garden is one of the analogies. And the, the beauty of all the different flowers together makes the world beautiful. We're for all if we're all the same color flower. That would be nice. But, you know, the beauty is the differences, too. So we have this uh, diversity, which is really great. Um, let's see. Um, maybe if we can put the first slide up, I'm going to. Um, so again, uh, last night's uh, presentation kind of reinforced this. This is a dawn picture. So we, Baha'is are very optimistic about the future. We do believe that this is the dawn of a new age. And so there's a new world order coming together as people from all over the planet are linked together. And we really saw in the last few years, and I saw this as a professor, how Zoom has really made it possible to connect with people all over the world. And my, actually, my, my wife, I got, when I worked over in India, I got married many, many decades ago over in India. My, my wife still has family all over the world. And we can connect face to face, not physically, but of course, face to face through Zoom. And you realize that, that the, the, over this last century, just the acceleration of technology and bringing people together who were so diverse throughout the world, and they're, they're neighbors now. They work in the same towns, the same businesses, the same communities, in your same churches. You see these people. So really, this has been an acceleration of this process. And so that's the good news, that we are coming together in this new world order. But there's also a disintegrating order. And I think Valerie alluded to that a little bit, too. There's a lot of breakdown, old systems, sometimes, sometimes neighbors... When they first meet each other or they live together too long, they, they bat battle a lot. And so we do see this kind of crumbling old order at the same time. So we have this crumbling and emergence. But Baha'is are very confident that uh, we are in the dawn of a new age. And so that this, you know, that the oneness of mankind will become the reality of the future. And so this first quotation is by Baha'u'llah. So there's two names. In fact, somebody was asking me this at breakfast. The two names that are central to the teachings of the Baha'i faith, one is the name Baha'u'llah. Baha'u'llah is actually an Arabic word. The Baha'i faith actually had its beginnings, not in Arabia, but actually in Persia, which is modern day Iran. And Baha'u'llah means literally the glory of God. And the other name is the Bab, B-A-B, Bab, who was a, a precursor to Baha'u'llah, who is who, and Baha'is believe that there were two um, religious teachers. The founders of the Baha'i faith are these two figures, Bob and Baha'u'llah. And Baha'is use the phrase, uh, they're, they're messengers of God, uh, they're teachers, and, uh, you know, that they're, uh, the, both the Bob and Baha'u'llah were both of this station. And Bob means the gate. So in many ways, coming from the... Um, from the Christian tradition, we talk about John the Baptist kind of opening the door, uh, you know, to the coming of Christ. Uh, in many ways, the Bob served that role, although the Bob actually was 
and, you know, uh, actually started a religion in Iran called the Babi faith. This is a little complicated. You, you have to read the details of that to get to it. But, uh, but he clearly pointed out that very soon that this uh, other teacher would come. This was Baha'u'llah. And uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about Baha'u'llah's history in the, in the future. But I want to, uh, I uh, was mentioning in my bio that I'm a poet. So as a poet, I can never resist the chance to offer some poetry, okay? And uh, so economists, if you may think that, uh, you know, it's odd for an economist to be a poet. First of all, it's, it's odd sometimes people say, an economist who believes in God. I remember working with one of my PhD professors, and he, and I, I, I kind of brought up my, my religious faith, and he, he kind of bluntly just said to me, Nobody believes in God anymore. I said, what? <laughs> so I thought that's where he's coming from. But I think there are some economists who believe in God. Uh, but then the other thing was an economist who writes poetry. But I tell people, all good economists write poetry. The reality is there's not many good economists. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. But anyhow, I, I wrote this poem. This is actually inspired by one of the writings of Baha'u'llah, where he kind of likens the transformation of civilization to alchemy. Remember that ancient science of, the, uh, particularly talked about in the medieval ages, of turning one metal into another, usually turning base metals like lead into gold. And so people were always trying to figure out how you can do this. And then Baha'u'llah said, the more challenging task we have as, as a civilization is really turning this kind of oftentimes very base civilization that we have, this very materialistic civilization, this very divisive civilization, and turning that into the paradise or the kingdom of God, if you will. How do we change this world into something better? So I wrote a poem, and uh, being an economist, I like to play by the rules. I like rhyming and counting my syllables and stuff like that. So this is a little Shakespearean uh, sonnet, okay? And it's called Divine Alchemy. What precious metal now is being wrought this day when all is dark as pitch or coal? The truth of life, is this the quest yet sought or have long years eclipsed that human goal? It seems a waste, so many should have died, forsaking life with faith in virtuous laws. Forgive their folly that they ever tried, if unattained, abandoned be that cause. Yet deep within earth's forge, a new spark burns, replacing ashen dreams with radiant hope and kindling lifeless forms with souls that yearn for alloys universal in their scope. With alchemy unequaled, God unfolds his will that turns dross lead to purest gold. Okay, thank you. So that's, the, that's the poetic side of mine, okay? But uh, I wanted to... I'm going to go through some slides, and I'll try to stick within the time limits, okay? So we'll just kind of fly through some of the slides, and I'll tell you a little bit about the history and the basic teachings of the Baha'is. And uh, certainly, as, as leaders of religion who work with your congregations, uh, hopefully these ideas will, you know, generate some thoughts and some, uh, you know, uh, different, different things that you can do in your own parishes and churches that uh, are, are helpful. So um, we have the next slide here. Okay, so what, first thing I started off, I, I, liked to, I came across this author. Some, I, I know somebody here is from England, maybe knows Paul Johnson, maybe you know, some of you know Paul Johnson. is an author. He's a philo British philosopher and writer, uh, and he's written a book uh, called The Quest for God. And he kind of opens the, the book with the kind of dramatic uh, declaration. He says, the existence or non-existence of God is the most important questions we humans are ever called on to answer. If God does exist, and in, if in consequence we are called to another life when this one ends, a momentous set of consequences follows. 
which should affect every day, every moment almost, of our earthly existence. Our life becomes a mere preparation for eternity. Actually, it's the only, I think that's a very important statement I think he's making there about the, the idea that we are here in the process to learn and to serve God. And uh, that I would only say that it's a preparation for eternity. But in a sense, if you have faith, you're already in eternity. You're already part of that eternity. And so we're living this life. But, but this is a question that in many parts of the world, people have kind of just dropped this search altogether. Or as my professor once told me, nobody believes in God anymore. And uh, so, and I think there's a kind of a, a theme of that that goes through. So we'll kind of look through some slides and I'll, I'll pick out some things here. Um, actually, I'm kind of standing in the way here, but the, the first word here is the, uh, this, is a, this is a quote from Baha'u'llah and uh, it's kind of the source of that poem actually. It says, first of all, the vitality of men's belief in God is dying out in every land. Nothing short of his wholesome medicine could ever restore it. The corrosion of ungodliness is eating into the vitals of human society. Okay. Um, I lost my place there. <laughs> uh, what else but the elixir of his potent revelation can cleanse and revive it? Is it within human power? And he says, Oh, Hakim. Baha'u'llah lived in Iran. Okay. So a lot of his writings, actually much of his writing is preserved. There's more than a hundred volumes, books, letters, tablets, and so on that he's written. So he's addressing someone in, uh, in his, his followers. Oh, Hakim. Uh, is it within human power, O oh, oh, ah, Hakim, to affect the constituent elements of any of the minute and indivisible particles of matter so complete to a transformation to transmute into, into purest gold? Perplexing and difficult as this may appear, the still greater task of converting satanic strength into heavenly power is one that we have been empowered to accomplish. The force capable of such a transformation transcendeth the, the potency of the elixir itself. The word of God can alone can claim the distinction of being, being endowed with the capacity for so great and far reaching a change. And so in this audience, you are people who really give the word of God. You, you know, you talk the, the words of Jesus the words of the prophets, that the word of God is the transforming force. And Baha'u'llah says that this, this word of God is the power that is going to transform humanity. And uh, too many people, as he said, the, the vitality of religion, this is true, not, not just in America, which we sometimes fall somewhere between secularism, where we just have separation of church and state, or atheism, okay? Um, but, we, we, but still many, you know, the majority of people in the United States still say they believe in God. When they do Gallup polls, they say, do you believe in God? Overwhelmingly, far, far more than many other developed countries, in, in my understanding, uh, Americans say they do believe in God. But the vitality and the division is still a problem, okay? And, uh, and the same was true in Iran. Iran uh, at that time, Iran are the Shia Muslim, and they have a lot of dis disputes with the Sunni Muslim, and... Uh, our speaker's not here today. We couldn't find more about that. But, but there's, there's just differences. It's a very powerful, Islam is a very powerful religion. And I lived and tra have traveled in Islamic countries. And it's a very, there's a lot of positive things that certainly come out of Islam in terms of social uh, interactions and things like that. So there's many positive things there. But the vitality and the, uh, the, the um, interpretation of a lot of the writings and the teachings have been diluted in some people's minds. So that's why it's important to kind of stay firm with the word of God to kind of, you know, uh, as, as Rabbi Seth said, okay, he said every day they read some of the Talmud to keep, keep current, you know, keep it in your mind, you know, have that daily prayer uh, to just kind of remind yourself uh, that, you know, of our station. Okay, next, next slide. Talking too much. This, this is the place where I actually heard of the Baha'i faith, actually. And there's actually, the, the picture doesn't do all, full justice here, but this is Lakeshore Drive in Wilmette. And the Baha'is, at great you know, personal sacrifice, Baha'is don't raise money from other people or anything like that. They raise among the Baha'is themselves. 
have built these houses of worship. And uh, this is the one that currently exists in North America, and it's in Wilmette, Illinois. And it's, it's surrounded by nine gardens. And the, and the, the number nine, Baha'is talk about, uh, we, talk, we brought up symbols and stuff like that that we have. Uh, symbols are important, but the, you know, the word of God is the ultimate important thing. Uh, and, but the symbolism here is of the letter of the number nine for Baha'is is it is the most inclusive integer. All the other integers, one through eight, are included in nine. And it represents that the Baha'is, all these buildings have nine sides. If you go around the world, I think there's a, I have a picture of another one, uh, the one from India, which I'm very familiar with. Is, it looks like a lotus, okay, and, but it has nine sides. And the idea is that it's open to all peoples of the world, all the religions, all the peoples of the world. And it is a common center, a common dome. So there's one God and there's many, many paths uh, to come to God. Um, and here it says here, O, ch o, o children, O ye children of men, the fundamental purpose animating the faith of God and his religion is to safeguard the interests and promote the unity of the human race and to foster the spirit of love and fellowship amongst men. Whatever is raised on this foundation, the changes and chances of the world can never impair its strength, nor the revolution of countless centuries undermine its structure. So he's really saying that you know, religion has this very powerful role and very powerful destiny in the world to really unite the human race. And again, I kind of remind that Baha'u'llah was saying this in 19th century Iran. And uh, in 19th century Iran, there wasn't a whole lot of thinking like this, even within the United States at this time. We were still dealing with you know, <coughs> slavery, the, the, the elimination of slavery in the country, the rights of women in the country, the, harm, the, the, the concept of science and the, the scopes monkey trials and things like that. We didn't understand science. We didn't understand anything. And we were going through these battles, and here was Baha'u'llah was writing in 19th century Iran that the time for the oneness of mankind has arrived, and that is the challenge. I remember when I first became Baha'i, I was raised in a family where we kind of taught about the oneness of mankind. I had friends of many different backgrounds, so I thought, well, that's not, you know, that's an interesting thought. I mean, everybody believes that. Everybody believes in the oneness of mankind, and it wasn't until later but I realized not everybody does believe that, you know, not everybody believes that. So this is something that really, um, you know, has to be advanced by people who follow, you know, as you do the word of God. Um, so next, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, the Baha'i faith also uh, has its, its uh, world center in the Holy land. And this is in Israel. This is Mount Carmel in Israel. And the historical circumstances of the Baha'is landing up in Israel are very interesting because Baha'u'llah himself, uh, first the Bab, who, who declared his mission in, in 1844 in Shiraz in southern Iran, immediately attracted many followers. Many people found him a very, very, you know, his message and his, his life and everything was very positive. So he attracted many followers. But as you might imagine, he also attracted a lot of you know, re negative reaction. And, and many of the followers, tens of thousands of the followers were killed, sometimes in very, very brutal fashions. And the Bob Bahab, the Bahab himself was executed in 1850 okay, uh, by the, the, uh, the government and the clergy uh, in, within uh, the government, really. With, in, many, in many cases, like the story of Jesus' death, where the government actually performs it, but a lot of the religious leaders at the time were kind of, you know, accelerating that, that conclusion. And so that was the case in Iran. So there was a lot of uh, pushing by the clergy and the Bab was, was executed. And this is the shrine, the Bab's body, okay, was actually left out in the street to rot, but uh, you know, that was gonna be one of the signs that he couldn't be who he said he was. The, the followers came up and they, they collected the body and they hid it for the next 50 years. And they eventually brought it to Mount Carmel in Israel. And then over the, the uh, next century, over the 20th century, this shrine was built. And this is called the Shrine of the Bab. And uh, I don't know if anybody's been to Haifa in Israel, but it's a very beautiful city. 
And uh, the gardens here are very well developed and it's very beautiful. The ba Baha'is are very uh, much into gardening, okay? And so there's very beautiful gardens, okay, surrounding this. Um, now, some of the teachings that Baha'u'llah brought were, first of all, the independent investigation of truth. And uh, so this is one of the reasons we don't actually have a clergy. And I'm not <laughs> saying anything bad about clergy. Clergy are extremely important still in this time in, in, in history. But clergy were very, very critically needed uh, in those days where most of the population couldn't read and write. They were just illiterate. And so they really depended upon teachers to kind of, you know, to, you know, to teach the, the word of God to them, to teach them the Bible, to teach them Quran, to teach them Bhagavad Gita, whatever. Uh, so they would, there would be clergy for that purpose. But in this day and age, really the, the process of universal education is not complete, but it's begun. And the, the possibility that all the peoples of this planet can learn to read and to investigate for themselves and to make their own minds up, okay, about what they believe in. That this is part of our independence as a human being is to make up our own mind, you know, what we believe in. And uh, we, we can't compel people to do that. So, um, and clergy have been wonderful. I'm, I'm I, you know, I'm 100% I'm certainty all the clergy here are wonderful people. But there have been clergy in the past of all religions who have abused their power and abused the fact that there was um, the people were illiterate and could be manipulated. And uh, so, you know, to kind of reinvigorating. And I think clergy will be with us for some years to come, certainly many you know, centuries to come. So that, that these clergy really are sticking true to the moral values and the word of God that they, they proclaim. The other thing is the idea of the oneness of God, that there's only one God. Um, I, I always, uh, I, I did another, my friend, my friend lawyer gets me to do all these lectures. She, she lines up my lectures. So she got me to do a lecture for the NAACP one time and we were talking, it was a, and it was, um, it was about Martin Luther King Jr. But I, I used, I drew the kind of analogy between Martin Luther King Jr.'s, you know, words and his ability to kind of, you know, talk about, you know, the, the, the quality of character of, of people and to lead this kind of nonviolent revolution, okay, of thinking. And uh, it's kind of a new paradigm, a new way of viewing the world. In exactly that same year, there was Apollo 8, I believe it was. Uh, William Anders was an astronaut going up and they were going to go study the moon. And they're kind of, the astronauts are kind of flying around the moon and all their cameras are focused on the moon and stuff like that. And Anders happens to look out the window on the side and he sees the earth. And he says, hey, give me a camera, give me a camera. And, I look at the, and he took a picture of that. That became known as a very famous picture called Earthrise. And to my knowledge, okay, I say I'm not a scientist, okay? Well, economic scientist, but I'm not a scientist. But I think that's the first picture of a human being taking. There were other pictures from satellites, but that's the first picture a human being took of Earth from space. But it was very clear from that picture that the paradigm of, of the human race is going to change. We are one planet. We are one people on one planet. So this is the new reality. So this, this kind of is, is, you know, worked its way into our culture. Uh, the other thing, so the oneness of religion, Baha'is believe that, you know, really that one, there is one religion, that uh, the religion is, you know, all the things we talked about, the golden rule and, uh, these types of things, the spiritual teachings of religion are very, very similar. And again, I lived in India. India is kind of a, it's kind of an opposite of the United States. It, we're, here in the United States, we have vast majority Christian, uh, Jewish community, very active Jewish community, and many other religions. In India, it's a vast majority of Hindu. Like 85% of the population is Hindu, about 12 or 13% are Muslim, and then other religions, including Zoroastrians and Baha'is, uh, small pockets of Christianity in some of the places like Kerala and Goa and, and, and spread throughout the country okay, were there. Um, in fact, at the school I worked at in India, many of the teachers were Christians because the Christians really kind of promoted education uh, in, in schools. And so a lot, of our, a lot of our teachers were from Goa and from Kerala uh, and, and you know, places where they uh, emphasized education. Uh, not that they, they emphasize education all over the country. I don't want to just to say, that, you know, but the, the, the Christians were really big on the school development and serving in schools. 
Um, Baha'is believe in the idea of universal peace, that a world federation, Baha'u'llah wrote about this, you know, uh, back in the 19th century. Uh, the Baha'is were one of the first non-government representatives at the United Nations. Uh, so the Baha'is believe that that type of model has got to develop and it's got to be perfected. I mean, it's not, I, it's, it's great, but it's not ideal at this point. It has to be uh, developed further. Uh, the elimination of all forms of prejudice. So uh, prejudice, you know, on race, on religion, on economic standing, on whatever, you name it. Prejudice has no place, okay, to prejudge people. Um, an important one here to the equality of men and women. Again, think about this. This is 19th century Iran, 19th century Persia, and say men and women are equal. Okay, and uh, so this is a, this is a challenging thing. The harmony of science and religion. That science, if if you have religious principles that are in conflict with science, then you might need to revisit some of those principles because science and religion really are explaining the same universe from different perspectives. So behind, you know, so the, the, the need for science and religion, the need for universal education, every child should have the right to an education. That should be absolute, you know, absolutely done. A universal auxiliary language. So the recognition that languages are important, you know, the culture, uh, my, my wife loves Hindi movies. So we watch Hindi movies. I've probably seen more Hindi movies than I can, I, I know I can, that I can remember, but, uh, but they love the culture of India. They love the Hindi music. They love the Hindi just dress and art and everything else, you know. So there's, there's uh, but every culture in the world brings some beauty to it. And every language of the world preserves beauty. In fact, the poetry of, of China, you know, or the poetry of Iran or the poetry of all countries around the world are very, very sacred to their people. They really, they really uh, love this. So we don't, we don't say get rid of languages but have one language that's common to everybody. You know, the one common language. And I've been traveling in places where I didn't speak, couldn't speak to anybody. And it's very frustrating sometimes <coughs> where you're unable to communicate. Um, the um, the ex elimination of the extremes of wealth and poverty. Okay, so the idea, we want creativity, we want entrepreneurs to create new businesses and new technologies, and we want this dynamic economy. I won't go into all that as an economist, but uh, we want all this, but also the extremes of wealth and poverty. And, and we don't expect that everybody's gonna have the same income. Just like I tell my students, I can give you all the same grade, but that means I'll have to take points from this person and give it to this person. You should see the, you should see the pushback I get on that. I'm gonna say, can I take two points? And this, this guy will pass if I just take two points from your 98 and put it on his 59 and you'll get up, you'll get up to 61 and he'll pass the course. Oh no, let him earn his own points, you know. But that, maybe that's the extremes of poverty. But, but we do recognize that there's gonna be diversity of incomes. But on the other hand, the extremes are really oftentimes becoming way too extreme. And there has to be some way to kind of moderate that. So uh, the, the Baha'is don't have an economic plan, but they have spiritual teachings. And we do believe that a lot of the moral and spiritual principles have to be applied to the economic system. Um, and um, why is there obedient to uh, the government? So the government tells us to do something. It's a lot like Rabbi Seth said. Uh, if it's something that doesn't violate our faith, you know, uh, like, you know, eat, what well, I forget is his example, eat the ham sandwich or I'm going to kill you or something like that. Eat the ham sandwich, you know. Uh, so, so if something doesn't violate our faith, we, we're going to obey the government. And uh, the government, because that creates order, on the other hand, if they, if they force you to deny your faith, okay. And that, this is unfortunately a problem for many of the Baha'is of Iran in particular right now, that the, the government of Iran is extremely anti-Baha'i and it fluctuates a little bit, but many Baha'is are in the position of having to deny their faith or die. And uh, so they're really, it's a, it's a very serious situation there. Um, and we're also actually Baha'is aren't, uh, we don't, register for political parties. Uh, we're very interested in what's going on in our society and we vote and participate, but we don't get involved in partisan politics per se. So we don't become Democrats or Republicans, for example, or you know, we don't become Labor Party and you know, uh, like in India, they had the Labor and the Congress and all the different parties, the BJP and you know, so on. Um, next slide, okay, I gotta, keep, I gotta keep talking here. 
So Baha'is do believe in something called progressive revelation. Excuse me, we're going to cough here for a second. <coughs> um, that the, uh, the Baha'is believe that there's been a historical revelation of the word of God over time. This could be a little bit challenging. And don't let the ascending nature uh, throw you off here. <coughs> let me get my... I can watch my time here, but um, anyhow, that the uh, Baha'is believe, much like school teachers uh, for the human race, that these various religions have come, and these individuals, you know, Zoroaster or Krishna or Moses, okay, uh, Jesus, Muhammad, these people have had an, just an incredible personal impact on believers for thousands of years where the philosophers sometimes come and go, these religions sink into the hearts of their followers and generation after generation that we see this kind of loyalty to these. So, so these people are, these individuals are something special. And Baha'is believe that they're all equal to each other, but that the message that they teach varies according to the students. And I always remember the quotation from my catechism class that, uh, where Jesus says, you have many things to learn. I have many things to say, but you cannot bear them now. So the world was not ready for the oneness of mankind 2000 years ago, but the world has changed. And this is the critical need of the day in which we live. So Baha'is believe that in fact, that the word of God and they're all equal. We're okay, four minutes, four minutes, okay. So anyhow, but anyhow, so this is kind of the, this is the idea of progressive revelation, that the message becomes stronger. So your, your third grade teacher is pro was probably a lot smarter and probably smarter, maybe smarter than your 12th grade teacher, but they, they didn't teach 12th grade stuff. They taught third grade stuff because that's where their students were. And uh, so mankind has been progressing. And so the Baha'is believe that this idea of progressive revelation is very strong. Next slide. This is a little history of the Baha'i faith. The Baha'i faith began, as I said before, in Shiraz, Iran. Shiraz is, Shiraz is here. Okay. And then the Baal actually, part of his mission was to go to the seat of Islam and proclaim a new day for religion, a new day for Islam, too. And uh, so it was a very courageous move. But, and he, you know, he, And Baha'u'llah actually uh, lived in Tehran, and he, he was imprisoned. Okay, so he was actually initially a follower of the Bab. He was imprisoned in Tehran. He was going to be executed, but then his, um, uh, they decided not to execute him. They decided to rather than exile him, just to drive him out of the country. And he was driven into as a prisoner of the Ottoman Empire. So he started off as a prisoner of the Persian Empire in 1853, and then in 1863, he, he moved to, uh, well, 1853, he, he moved to um, uh, Baghdad, okay, and was a prisoner there, and then from there, he was exiled further into Turkey, into the Ottoman Empire, to what we call Constantinople, and Edirne, or Adrianople, uh, in those days, and then to get rid of Baha'u'llah, so he wouldn't have any more presence, he was actually put on a ship and sent to the most, one of the most outcast regions of the world. And you can read about this city in, in history books, but the city of Akka, sometimes pronounced Acre, A-C-R-E, Akka in Israel, was Palestine, was part of the Ottoman Empire at that time. And Baha'u'llah was imprisoned there. And uh, so then Baha'u'llah lived there in, in prison uh, his entire life and eventually died in prison. And actually the, one of the, the things I have here is a picture of the shrine of where Baha'u'llah is buried in, uh, in Israel. And so for Baha'is, Israel is a place of pilgrimage also. The Baha'is, at least once in their lifetime, try to make that trip to Israel to visit that. And uh, that's, that's the, the shrine right there on the left. And uh, that's kind of the nine-pointed star. And there's another symbol there, which I can, if anybody wants to know, I can talk about in the questions. But um, if we can go to the next slide, too. I just want to get through all the slides. So, 
Okay, uh, one of the books that was very important that when Baha'u'llah was traveling, Baha'u'llah actually wrote what's called the Proclamation of Baha'u'llah, and he actually addressed it to the leaders of the world. And so this is a book that has, and he, he wrote to uh, Napoleon III, Tsar Alexander, Queen Victoria, Kaiser Wilhelm, uh, Emperor Francis Joseph, Sultan Aziz, Nasruddin Shah, to the rulers of America. He had no contact with America personally, uh, but the, and then the elected representatives of people around the world and a summons to the religious leaders. So he, he wrote these tablets to them kind of saying that, uh, you know, serve your people. Uh, don't amass power. Don't amass all these arm armaments. Don't drive your people into all this warfare. And, uh, you know, be, you're, you're as a leader of your country, you are the servant of your people. And very eloquently stated in a lot of these, I don't have time to do it now, but, but that's, that, that was one of the roles and one of the stations that Baha'u'llah had was really to proclaim to these leaders. Interestingly enough, these were all very important people. And Baha'u'llah was a prisoner in Akka. And they're getting this letter from him and they're thinking, what? What's this all about? Who's this person, you know, writing us from a prison in Akka? But Queen Victoria was the one who kind of responded positively to it. And, and not much, but she just kind of said, if this is from God, it can do no harm. So let it be, you know? So she was kind of, but the others were kind of like out the window, but they turned out to have a bigger presence than he thought. Next slide is... Okay, so there's a worldwide Baha'i community. There's Baha'is. Uh, typically, uh, Baha'is are everywhere. Every race, every nation, every group of people, you know, throughout the world, there are Baha'i communities. Uh, in India, there's a large Baha'i community that I worked with for a long time. And then uh, here in the United States. So you'll see a lot of Baha'is. But Baha'is really come from all backgrounds and really uh, represent, as, as we, you know, that's our goal, the oneness of humanity. Okay, next slide. Okay. Baha'u'llah uses the analogy of the, the physician, okay? That the, the prophet of God comes into the world and he says, he says the all-knowing physician has his finger on the pulse of mankind. He perceiveth, the, he, he perceiveth the disease and prescribeth in his unerring wisdom the remedy. Every age hath its own problem and every soul its particular aspiration. The worm, remedy the world needed in its present day afflictions can never be the same as a subsequent age may require. Uh, be anxiously concerned of the needs of the age ye live in and center your deliberations on its exigencies and requirements. So again, you know, this age we live in, the disease is the fracture of so many different, you know, groups and societies and so on. And the remedy is the recognition of the, the oneness of all people. So even people are different, and maybe you don't understand the differences, maybe you're not affiliated with it, but love everyone. You know, recognize that everyone is a, a creation of God. And uh, so the, the, it goes on there, but it's a, uh, but he, he, the last sentence says, incline your ears to the sweet melody of this prisoner. Arise and uplift your voices that happily, they that are fast asleep can be awakened. So, you know, it's a, the, the, the biography and the history and the writings of Baha'u'llah are a very, very interesting subject. And again, we have records. It's, it's only, it's a century, two centuries altogether. Uh, so it's not that long, you know, uh, this there. So we can see, I think we're getting close to the end here. Okay. And Baha'u'llah's son, whose name was Abdul Baha, Abdul means servant. Okay. His actual, his actual real name was Abbas Effendi. But Abdul Baha, as he's known, came to the United States in 1912. He was a prisoner with his father from the age of eight until the Young Turk Revolution in 1907. And after that, he planned and he traveled to Europe and he traveled to the United States. And he writes in a very, very philosophical, uh, spiritually philosophical way. Actually, the writings of all of the, the, the Baha'u'llah and Bob and so on, they're, they're, you can, you can, you know, they're different styles, different genres of, of writing, definitely. But uh, Baha'u'llah, or Abdul Baha came to America and he, he taught actually in all over the Northeast uh, in, uh, and really, you know, gave, gave talks in New York and um, Philadelphia and Washington and Chicago and up in Maine and all over the place. Uh, but he, he uh, gave these talks and, uh, and in fact, the, the, uh, the heading of the, the thing was walking the spiritual path with practical feet that the president of Stanford University, where he spoke, actually used that to describe Abdu'l-Bahá. He's a very practical person, very practical. 
But here's the prayer. It basically says, O thou kind Lord, this gathering is turning to thee. These hearts are radiant with thy love. These minds and spirits are exhilarated by the message of thy glad tidings. O God, let this American democracy become glorious in spiritual degrees, even as it, as it has aspired to material degrees, and render this just government victorious. Confirm this revered nation to upraise the standard of the oneness of mankind, of, of humanity, to promulgate the most great peace, to become thereby most glorious and praiseworthy among all the nations of the world. O oh God, this American nation is worthy of thy favors and deserving of thy mercy. Make it precious and near to thee through thy, bestowal, thy bounty and bestowal. Mm -hmm. So it's a very positive, uplifting mission. Uh, and forward thinking that they, they recognize the United States was unusual in the world. It really was the coming together of people from all different backgrounds. And that no place on earth will become more apparent this, the idea of the oneness of humanity uh, than in the United States. And that they, the United States should use this to really kind of model this and serve the rest of the world. And so anyhow, but the, uh, and I think, that's, I think that's it. So thank you and questions. Over time, over time. But I'd be happy to take any questions. If anybody has any questions? Any chat questions? No questions? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, um, I'm wondering, like, in the, in the church, we have congregations that, for, that gather people for worship and mission and fellowship. How do the Baha'i structure themselves for do you have those kind of communities where you do that stuff? What about evangelism, too? Okay, Baha'i communities, actually, uh, since we don't have clergy, what Baha'is in any community they live in, like, you'll have what's called a local spiritual assembly or a local assembly. And it's nine elected people that, you know, are the governing body for that community for that year. And they organize plans and, uh, and so on. Uh, like in other religions, you know, certainly Baha'is have uh, their own calendar, too. So we have a calendar of 19 months of 19 days. Uh, and on every 19th day, there's a feast. OK, so there's a feast okay, for the uh, Baha'is. So the Baha'i community gets together. And it's a period of prayer and then consultation and then um, social, a social gathering of the, of the friends and so on. So that happens everywhere in Baha'i communities all over. And, uh, and Baha'is individually engage through their professions, certainly to do public service to people, but also as a Baha'i community. As we grow, the Baha'is have started schools. The school I worked at in India was actually founded by two Baha'i women uh, back in 1945, at the end of World War II. They moved up into the mountains in Maharashtra, and with the help of the local community, they started a school, which is now quite a, a thriving uh, school that runs through, you know, kindergarten up through junior college is residential school as well as, uh, you know, general, general school. And so Baha'is are engaged in service. Uh, we have uh, Baha'is uh, scholars and so on uh, contribute ideas and participation with conferences on the environment, on elimination of prejudice, on you know, all kinds of things, you know, the, the economic issues that the world faces and so on. So Baha'is are very much involved in the global conversation on these things. And uh, so it's, it's, it's an involved community. So that's one of the, the functions. I have a question and I'm curious because you haven't mentioned the LGBTQ plus community and whether the Baha'i faith is embracing them also. Baha'i Baha faith, Baha'u'llah teaches to embrace all people. Okay, so, so, so regardless of what their sexual preference is or things that people are accepted. Uh, Baha'u'llah does, you know, state about the relationship between the this, this, this sanctity of marriage. Okay, and uh, he does state about the sanctity of the marriage. The purpose of the marriage is the procreation of children. Okay, so some people will look at that as a very conservative approach to these things, if not very difficult approach for people to, to deal with in this day and age. Um, but nevertheless, Baha'u'llah says that all of all people are of God and, you know, are, are make their decisions themselves 
And uh, but we do, you know, we do look at the sanctity of marriage between a man and a woman as being kind of a fundamental aspect of, of the faith. And uh, some of these teachings are hard, especially in this day and age. And uh, so the question becomes down to, do you believe who, you know, and I, I say there are issues that's, that come up that sometimes people wrestle with, Baha'is themselves wrestle with. And, uh, and the question comes down to, do you think that Baha'u'llah was who he said he was? Do you have faith? We don't necessarily agree with all the teachings. People may have disagreed with some of Jesus's teachings or some of, you know, Moses's teachings and so on. People may have had problems with those and they wrestle with them. That's kind of a spiritual battle for those individuals. But, uh, and it's, so that's, that's part of the thing. There are Baha'i laws and Baha'i uh, structure that, that, so the question is, do you believe in Baha'u'llah? Okay, that's the question. Yes. So outside, um, we have a little table out there that have a couple of um, things that you can take away. And all, all, the, all the things are, you know, are, are yours that you can take away. But especially, I wanted to... Um, uh, to uh, Make, make note of the fact that we have the golden rule, and I know that's the theme <clears throat> for, the, for the weekend. So the golden rule here, um, this was published by a Baha'i publishing uh, firm, and uh, it's the golden rule repeated in all the great world religions, Hinduism, Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, Judaism, and the Baha'i faith. And a sweet, very sweet little uh, illustrations of children, you know, praying in their, in their way. But please take one. Um, take one, take two. Feel free to do that. And also, I wanted to mention, too, that Jim and or I um, are always available to any of your churches, uh, to, um, you know, to youth groups or whatever it is, however we can be of service to you. We are here to be of service to you, for sure. Yeah, it was a, it's, a, it's a lot to cover in a half hour. Well, I didn't do my half hour. I kind of expanded my half hour out. Okay. Uh, it's a lot to cover, but there's a, there's a very rich history, very uh, comprehensive teachings. And uh, I think, you know, that, uh, that one of the things that when Abdu'l-Bahá came to the country, he really talked to the American clergy and really emphasized their important role in kind of bringing people back to be, you know, uh, to be with the law of God to be, to behave in a, in a positive way that builds community. And uh, so that's, that's the greater message. Okay. So anyhow, thank you again. Thank you. 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 Thank